Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. I think it is fair to say that Jewish tradition has a very deep connection with the idea of emet, truth. It is said that emet is one of those words that teaches a lesson even with its appearance, in that emet is composed of the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. It's an all-encompassing notion, and one that if we hold fast to the idea of truth, gives us, the word suggests, the entire world. In our morning prayers and our evening prayers, we focus on emet. It's the first word that we say after the Shema. It leads us into the next section, the section that speaks about redemption. Morning and evening, we look at the word emet. We sing emet ve'emunah, emet atahu rishon. We speak about truth and steadfastness, and we say it is true that you, O oh God, are the first and the last, and without you there is none else. We are focused on emet. Many people say it's the emes, my hand to God, and that's considered somebody's most profound vow of, of truth and, and commitment to what is absolutely real. In our Torah blessings, we sing about truth, but not until after we've heard the Torah. In the closing blessing, the traditional concluding blessing over the Torah reading, which we did just a few minutes ago, we sang, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Torat Emet Bechaye Olam Nata Betochenu Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Praised is the Eternal One, Sovereign of the Universe, who has given us a Torat Emet, a Torah of truth, implanted within us everlasting life. It's to suggest that after we've heard the Torah reading, we're uplifted and we're affirming the truth of what we have just heard. Very different from the opening blessing, which is more a statement of fact. The Jewish people received this particular tradition, we were given it, and we have carried it forward. That's sort of the opening blessing. The closing blessing, much more poetic, with this central notion of a Torah emet, a Torah of truth. But it's a puzzling phrase. Are we to believe that the stories, myths, and miracles in the Jewish Bible are absolutely true as described? Or does the expression, which comes from the prophet Malachi, chapter 2, verse 6, teach instead that the Torah is a book of deep, profound, capital T truths about life and living? Certainly, at least to my thinking, it's the latter. But if the Torah portrays capital T truths, some of which are sometimes very hard to receive, about life, what do we do with the occasional bent truth, or even outright untruth, that appears in our sacred text? Could even the not-so-true give insight into Judaism's most cherished values and truths. At the close of the book of Genesis, Jacob died and was gathered to his kin. That's Genesis 49, verse 33. The mourning and burial period which is described was elaborate. And when it ended, Joseph's brother's knees were trembling. They feared he would finally avenge their earlier and near murderous treatment of him. So the brothers concocted a fib. They sent this message to Joseph, Genesis 50, verses 16 and 17. They sent this message to Joseph. Before his death, your father left this instruction. Say to Joseph, forgive, I urge you, the offense and guilt of your brothers who treated you so harshly. Therefore, the brothers said, please forgive the offense of the servants of the God of your father's house. According to the brothers' statement, the late patriarch seems to have wished nothing more before his death than reconciliation between his estranged sons. But as far as we know, 
It was a total whopper, a fabrication that led to a glorious and unprecedented act of forgiveness. Joseph then said to them, have no fear. Am I a substitute for God? Moreover, although you intended me harm, God intended it for good, so as to bring about the survival of many people. Fear not, I will sustain you and your dependents. Thus he reassured them and spoke soothingly to their hearts. Chapter 50, verse 19 through 21. Now, Dr. Lieber of Blessed Memory suggests that maybe that was the ultimate punishment, that after all they had been through, the brothers have to be dependent on Joseph for their welfare and survival. But regardless, this is an extraordinary moment where what appears to be an untruth leads to shalom by it, peace in the house. Back in the days of multicolored coats and portentous dreams, there was no joy in the house of Jacob. Quite literally, the brothers could not speak a word of shalom to Joseph back in chapter 37, verse 4. That's the word the Torah uses. They couldn't speak a word of shalom. But by the end of Genesis, the brothers' great fib meant the family could finally be reunited in both body and spirit. Shalom by it, peace in the home, was restored. Now the episode stands out, but it's not entirely alone. Back in Genesis 18, shocked at the notion that she could become pregnant, Mother Sarah had said, will I have pleasure again with a husband so old? But God told a half-truth, sparing Abraham's feelings and deliberately misquoting Sarah. He says to Abram, why did Sarah laugh, saying, will I really have a child now that I am old? God's omission of Sarah's derisive words about her husband and the brother's fiction of Jacob's instructions led the sages to determine by majority that truth could, maybe even should, be stretched for the sake of maintaining familial harmony. Now, not all the sages agreed. <laughs> they said in the case of Abraham and Sarah, God was sparing the feelings of Abraham. In the case of Jacob's sons, what they were doing is saving their own skin. So <laughs> the commentators don't exactly all uniformly hold both untruths up to the same level. But it's remarkable the way the two instances work in tandem and really out of necessity. Because if only God had spoken with pretense, we would assume that that privilege was reserved only for the Most High. And if only the brothers spoke falsely, despite the happy ending, we might correctly question their choices and behaviors yet again. But with the two events, human and divine stretching of the truth, we observe a carefully constructed capital T truth offered with restraint and wisdom. We must use caution when molding the truth, but we know that there is room to do so when there is so much at stake. Shalom Bayit is a rare and precious commodity. Far too many homes are without it. So many countless families are in rupture. And for our countless brothers and sisters who have no permanent or even temporary home, no buy it. Finding peace is even more elusive, and this is a truth of our age, and maybe every age. We know in our synagogue that there are ways to help, and one is through support of caring organizations such as the aptly named Shalom Bayit. That's the Bay Area Tzedakah that offers sanctuary to families suffering the scourge of domestic violence, and it aims to increase awareness of the pain and lasting trauma of abuse in the home. For those of you who have participated in our annual Adopt a Family program that we have joined with Shalom Bayat to do, we have donated wished for items for typically a mother and children who have been forced to flee a Bayat where there was no Shalom, an untenable situation. We know that it's a drop in the ocean, but it has had a huge impact, 
one family at a time. I think if we took a long moment, we could probably each think of a time in our lives when we could have, should have, or did stretch the truth to maintain harmony in a relationship. Might be something to think a little bit more about as we go through our Shabbat and in the days to come. When do we stretch the truth? What has been the consequence? I concur with the majority of the rabbis that Shalom Bayit is an absolutely godly objective and that it's even worth telling an intermittent tall tale to preserve it and safeguard the dignity and safety of our loved ones. But I would add a note of caution. Excessive peacemaking can sometimes obscure real and hard truths that need to be said. Many of us have an understandable aversion to conflict, and that can lead to denial and paralysis in too many homes. For instance, failure to give guidance and discipline to young people or ignoring destructive lifestyles and habits of older members of the family can really mire a household in a downward spiral. Families have to develop constructive communication habits and even engage in rebuke at times. And this is also a deeply held Torah value, of course, as you all know from the middle of the Torah in Leviticus 19. It comes right before love your neighbor. We are told you must surely rebuke your fellow. That's not easy to do. And in thinking about elderly or um, infirm members of the family that we are thinking about this week in the stories of Jacob and King David, that can be the most important and maybe most difficult time to have conversations where we confront hard truths. I'll just touch on this a little bit today and maybe bring it back at a later time. I've been reading a little tiny book tiny. Uh, it was a gift from my brother by a Swedish woman named Margareta Magnusson. And its name is, stay calm everyone, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. This is a Scandinavian concept. It's an old word, actually, in Swedish. Well, it sounds better in Swedish. Dostatnung. It's better. Um, but it translates to death cleaning. And this is a wonderful little volume uh, presented with humor and forthrightness that says, folks who have still the strength and the decision-making capabilities should love their families and friends more than they love their stuff and should do everything they can to leave a clean and clear path in their homes so that loved ones, friends, family will remember them with kindness and not with burden of having to do an overwhelming amount of clean out once the loved one has passed. It's kind of a purging, if you will, that we experienced this week with Jacob and with David, sort of a purging, not just of emotions, but in this little book, it's talking very much about things. But she also talks about having difficult conversations, telling the truth to dear ones. And she gives a few suggestions, but one that I liked very much was to say to a dear one, is there anything we can do together in a slow way so that there won't be too many things to handle later? It's a kind of a confronting the truth without saying it too harshly but these are truths that none of us really ever want to face. They can be done with love, they can be done with a little shading, and sometimes they need to be done just straight on. Shalom Bayit doesn't always mean adjusting the truth to ensure it, because sometimes telling it the way it is is the most loving act that there can be. It is a delicate art to be sure, and that, maybe more than anything else, 
is a capital T, truth. Shabbat shalom.